Every moment brings you to this moment. Everything in your past, all of our histories, everything brings us to this moment. And every moment's a new moment. So you're standing on the edge of potential all the time. So if we begin to look for a bigger and broader horizons, the question I have is, how's it going to look? Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, visit our website at nonserviummedia.com. If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word, and so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to the 28th episode of the show and the first episode we've done in front of a live audience. If you listen to our episode with Logan Marie Glitterbaum, you'll recall us discussing an event she was planning called Coup de Gras, Electric Luau. Non-Servium did end up participating in the festival, and it ended up being a blast. So big thanks to Logan and everyone else who helped organize the event and for inviting us. For this episode, we ended up speaking with someone who's been a friend of mine for several years now, and also someone who's had a significant impact on how I approach radical politics. He's been described by the FBI as a domestic terrorist, and by others as one of the most significant anarchist organizers in the U.S. Here's my interview with Scott Crow. Scott is an international speaker, author, and storyteller who's proudly from a working class background. He's an author, political organizer, educator, activist, filmmaker, dad, and musician. For over two decades now, he's focused on diverse socio-political issues and the explorations of creating and exercising counterpower to capitalism in the state. He's probably best known for helping to organize the Common Ground Collective during Hurricane Katrina, and is currently focusing his efforts on building his record label, Emergency Hearts. Scott Crow, how the hell are you? Hey man, I'm good. Nice to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> you too. Don't um, believe half the bullshit he just said. I just want everybody to know that. Let's be clear about that. <laughs> I don't believe any of that shit. <laughs> hey, so, um, so, 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 what's been going on? What's what's new in your life? Mm, mostly, uh, like everybody, just being on lockdown. You know, contending with the political disaster that we had for the last few years uh, in the economic and. Uh, you know, environmental and natural disasters we've been having. Last year was a tough year for a lot of people. Uh, and, you know, and for me, it was just a person who's a lot of grief, you know, lost a lot of close friends and family last year. And uh, it's just an interesting time. So, like, uh, and it's in deep, dark winter right now. So I feel like I'm uh, closed in, you know, and like I, not isolated, but definitely like uh, cocooned, I guess. You know, how about you? Yeah. I mean, I've I've been making it through. The isolation is uh, not easy for me. I'm a very social person, so I mean, I mm-hmm. I talk to you probably more than anyone else in the world right now. With Same, collaborating on uh, with this Emergency Hearts record company that you have going on. We can talk about more of that a little later. Sure, Scott, you've been interviewed so many times. What's one of the most annoying questions you're asked regularly? Mainly, it's the ones that. When the, the interviewer hasn't looked at and asked the same questions that have been asked 700 times. Yeah. And that's the, and the thing is, I, I approach that idea with two different ways. One being just kind because they have a, a different audience probably, but most they ask the same basic questions uh, again and again. And that's the only thing, you know, like, and it's, and it's okay most of the time. Yeah. Uh, and the other one that is just now is like, I just don't like to talk about all the specifics of Katrina so much anymore spoken about it for you know 10 or 15 years pretty you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times yeah not not the broader ideas but just the logistics of it you know or whatever not the logistics i don't even know how to say it. the stories within it you know mm-hmm. so nothing really annoys me that much sure sure 
Well, I tell you what, if I if I ask you anything that approximates an annoying question, just say pass. I'll just I'll just flip the script. I'll just ignore it. All right. There you go. There I don't you go. have to say anything. Start talking about what I want to. <laughs> so, Scott, so this is this question is not going to be original by any means. Sure. A lot of people like to give a psychological context for the mind that is the uh, guest who I'm speaking with. I think this is especially true with you, Scott. So how did you go from your humble beginnings in a working class background from Texas to super activist, anarchist, and what you've become now? Desperation on one hand, I think, and the other hand is the curiosity to solve problems. I think those are two things that have shaped me. One is about the past because Everything in our histories, personally, politically, socially, culturally, ethnically, brings us to this moment. Even if you want to go bigger than that, our time in larger history at this moment, just everything brings us to this moment. And every moment's a new moment. But everything in our past shapes us. Uh, whether we want to admit it or not, it helps to shape our future. And so uh, my past, you know, uh, I grew up working poor. I grew up in the, the last times when rural living was the majority in the United States. I was at the very end of it, the last major exodus of that in the 70s. I, that's when I was growing up. So I grew up in this somewhat rural and urban living. There was cattle and horses around me, but at the same time, the suburbs were coming in. And so uh, those are a couple of pieces. And the other thing is that prisons and drug addiction and alcoholism run throughout my family. And so those things have really shaped my life because I grew up thinking I was going to go to prison. But I lived, you know, like I, I grew up in the country music scene and I grew up with a lot of outlaws in that world. And actually people, I guess they were kind of outlaws. I've just been reassessing this lately and thinking about it again. But my dad played drums for George Jones and Tammy Wynette for 25 years, but he also was in prison for 20 years. So those two things kind of affected. And, you know, he was only in my life for 10 years, but it just had a major profound effect. But the other thing is that when I was just coming up, I just wanted to figure out how to solve problems. Like when I saw people on TV and stuff, those families weren't like the families I had. And I didn't know. And so was, I want to know who these people were and how they got that. And it wasn't just about economic climbing. It was about, well, why are some people poor and some people are not? And I didn't understand it. And it's just been a long journey of exploration in that and trying to solve problems and alleviate suffering. It's so trite, but that's the truth of it, you know? I don't think it's trite at all. I mean, that, that makes plenty of sense to me. I mean, it's interesting how, how everyone comes to where they are. But um, something else that we've talked about before at some length is whether or not we view anarchy as a means, an end, or something in between. In the video interview we did with you a long time ago, you were talking about anarchy as something that was not achievable, but something that we do regardless mm -hmm. in order to sort of make these incremental changes towards liberation. Is that still how you see it? Am I misinterpreting you? Or how do you, how do you see it in general? Is it a means, an end, or something in between? It's just a set of ideas. It's just a liberatory set of ideas with a political reference, a political and philosophical reference. I still hold true to all of those things that, that we should strive for the ideas of anarchy, but it doesn't matter whether we call it anarchy. I mean, it, there's other people who are on paths that are these paths of consciousness too that, are, that don't call it anarchy. And that, that's just as important and just as valid. Anarchy is just a set of terms, loaded political terms that we have come up with. But I draw the distinction between anarchy and anarchism, though, is anarchism has become much more of an, a set of rigid ideologies that we have to adhere to. You start to have canonization of, you know, this is the official scripture of it. These are the, the official saints and shit like that. It starts to sound like organized religion to me. And I'm against that. I'm against ideology because it rigidifies the openings that we can have and the possibilities that we can have. Mm -hmm. And so I still use anarchy as a point of reference. It's the jumping off point. It is not the ends and means. It is just a way to get along. And for me, at the minimum, I think if you strive for those ideas and those dreams and those possibilities, that it makes you less of a shitty person. Not compared to somebody else, but because it's the ideas of cooperation, the ideas of having autonomy and having control of your own life, but also working with other people to have control of their lives too. And so I think at its base, without even trying, I mean, those are honorable things to do, whether we call it anarchy or not. Mm -hmm. And as far as like the political questions around it, that, you know, deserves to be seen. But what I would say about anarchy, that maybe we talked about this before, Joel, and, I, and, and if we did, just stop me again, but it's um, that it's open-ended. I never preach revolution because 
revolutions always end up with fascists controlling the power in, a, in the political questions. And so what I want us to do is strive for this. So as things break apart, we're just creating more, I, I want to say much healthier ecosystems amongst each other, you know, to get along, to cooperate with each other. And that anarchy is not the answer to it. It just provides some guideposts to get there. Now, here's some ideas and that we can reinvent them and change them as we go. And that's what I like about it. And so that's kind of still the approach I'm on, because I think that that we need it. You know, like this is my theme about disasters is that this is why I don't preach revolutions, because disasters are everywhere, whether it's ecological or natural, you know, like a storm or earthquake or fires. We're having more and more of those as climate changes. But there's political disasters, there's war, you know, there's economic disasters like we had in 2008. You know, like all of these things break up the status quo of what we think the world is and that we need to resituate ourselves in that. And I think creating networks is a way to build more strength and resilience in doing that on small scales. And so it's just something I like and believe. And if it comes true, great. If it doesn't come true, it doesn't hurt anybody along the way because we're not trying to seize power. Mm, sure, sure, sure. So why do you think so many people abandon anarchy later in life? Don't you see the theme of people like sort of falling off, whether it's within activist circles or, or anything else? Maybe they don't abandon it ideologically, but they sort of burn out, you know? I only see people abandon anarchy in, in activist circles. I don't see people who are serious thinkers about it ever, 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 ever drop it. I mean, I know people who have been writing about and thinking about these ideas for 60 and 70 years, you know, mm -hmm. and that's not just like rare people. I mean, there's people who are doing that. So, but what I think is that the manifestations of anarchism and anarchy in the United States have mostly been anarchism, right? It was red and black. It was like workers, you know, worker, you know, black and red stuff where it's like you're coming out of like working class areas, you know, worker cooperatives, you know, building power, labor power and stuff. But I think that what happens is that the containers of activism, which no matter what spectrum you're on, kind of cloud everything, people leave that because there's not very much for it. Because activism is really about resisting power, but it's not about creating power. A lot of the manifestations of it are only creating power to resist larger power. So I think people leave because it gets frustrating, because we don't, we're not building, we're doing a lot of resisting and not a lot of creating. Mm -hmm. And so that's my estimation of it. I think the other thing is disillusionment that happens with people because capitalism is very, actually it's all economic systems that we are in right now. I wouldn't even just say capitalism, we can say socialism with a big S, you know, dictatorial communism, whatever flavors that we have going around the globe right now. They're very powerful uh, cultural and structural institutions that are reinforced daily and it's hard to live and think outside of those. It's hard to imagine and then want to make the sacrifice to live outside of those because they can draw us in so easy. They sing their siren song all the time to draw us back in, you know? So that's, a, that's kind of what I think about that. But I, I think also the manifestations of anarchy in the United States and many places in Europe have not very much relevance outside of specific ideological or activist subcultures too. And I, that's the truth of it. And that's the biggest, I think the biggest problem with it. What's the reason you left activist subcultures? Okay, there's a thing that happens in activism that it took a long time for me to figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. Like, why do people leave all the time? Like, I've been doing this thing for 35 years. I haven't always been an anarchist, but I've been doing this for 35 or almost 40 years. But I've known tens of thousands of people that have come through and people who had been in for a long time, but they always leave. And I, so I started to ask myself, what is it? Well, there's a, there's a, there's a social development that happens where this happens with individually, but, but I'm going to put a political framing on it, which is that when we all are growing up as people, it's not just age, because you can do this at different times in your life, but at some point when you, you grow up, you reject the culture that you have come up in. Usually it's rejecting your parents, rejecting religion, rejecting maybe government to a degree, but you reject that first because you have to, this is how you build who you are and you begin to explore who you are. So the second phase, that's phase one, and the second phase is that you begin to ask the questions, who am I? And you try on all these hats. So you see people in their teenage years and in their, in their 20s generally, but people do it at all ages. But they're trying to figure out who it is. And they're like, am I, in political terms, am I a communist? Am I an anarchist? Am I trans? You know, like, am I a black nationalist? You know, like there's, 
different things. Again, just I'm giving a political framing for this. I'm not talking about everybody's you know individuality, but so so that's the main thing that happens. And then what happens generally is that once you figure out your identity, you've tried on, you've gone to all the clubhouses, and you've done all these things, and you've figured out who you are, you begin to enter the mainstream world again with your new identity. And so you've just now have become a new person, whoever that is. So what happens is that activism draws us in because it's anti-authoritarian at all levels. Everybody wants to fight the power. But then we don't retain anybody because we just have the first two phases coming in and out repeatedly. And so when we do that, the people who get into the third phase leave because there's nothing for them. There's nothing that's been built for the long term. There's nothing that's sustainable for. I'm going to use the word adults, but that doesn't that sounds more derogatory. But people who have tried to figure out their way in the world, you, it's hard to be a Let's pretend you're a doctor or, or something, and it have to be that elegant, but pretend you're a doctor. Well, if you're an, a doctor in activist world, there's only a couple of ways that you can engage with them. And then, and what I realized is that people that stayed in, like myself for a long time, had to create positions for themselves, not a power, but had to always create worlds outside of that. And so there was not a lot of growth and people just kept leaving. So I was just finally tired of having to do 101 things again and again for the 500th time or the 6,000th time. Mm -hmm. And it's not because they're not valuable. I just didn't want to be a part of them anymore. Yeah. It just, there was no value in it for me anymore. Not even as an elder, it was getting to be, there was not enough in it. So I left. So, and I got tired of resisting. I want to build stuff. For sure. I want to challenge people to build and create, not that we don't resist, but in a liberatory way. Right. So that's kind of where, where I ended up. All right, I'm going to say something that you might not completely like with this framing of who you are. But I see you as sort of embodying to some extent like this entrepreneurial spirit with an egalitarian's heart. Sure. So, like you have like this, you are actually building constantly. More than anyone I've known, you've been involved with so many different activist projects. And you were just saying how people shape their identities to some extent when they're like exploring these worlds. How do we make sense of those who shaped their identity and landed at authoritarian communism? Like how do, how do we make sense of tankies as they exist? Why did they reemerge? I, I can tell you why, this is m my opinion, everybody's not gonna like this, but I'm just gonna tell you what it is. People like things like communism and right libertarianism, big L libertarianism, and I'm gonna say it, even agorism, because it's familiar. And it's, this is the same thing with activist subculture and even creating most leftist co-ops and stuff, is that they become systems within capitalism that don't really necessarily challenge them, but they're based on familiarity, culturally, politically, socially, economically, it's something that's very familiar. It's hard to think about something so far outside of what our lives are. The most extreme ends of this, I would say, in my opinion, would be communist with a big C and anarcho-capitalist in <laughs> yeah. particular. Because neither one of them really want to give up anything. They just want to rearrange the chairs so that they have the power situation. Sure. Well, I mean, that's the truth. That's not even, I mean, it's, I guess it is. It's not really my opinion. It's my analysis on it. I guess it's my opinion. And I don't even mean that to kick people like I'm, I'm, I'm not. And anarchism falls into that anarchism. All forms of ideologies fall into it. And so something that, again, like I mentioned earlier, to think not even outside the box, to not even imagine a box at all is so hard for people to do. They cannot see it. I'm just going to say this. This relates how Common Ground Collective after Hurricane Katrina was different than any other organization that had come before it that formed after disaster was because we said, we're not gonna just do one thing like, oh, let's do food, not bombs, because we're all comfortable and familiar with it, we've been doing that, or let's not, let's do legal aid because we're comfortable. Let's do every fucking thing. Let's make them all, let's do everything. Let's rebuild civil society. From so, and because the need was so great way before Katrina, but definitely after Katrina, it made, I don't want to say easier because it was hard as hell, but it, it just created openings, like what the Zapatistas call the crack in history. And so once that crack was open, we just tried to pry it open and open. And we had to fight against not just state and power, but we had to fight against ourselves and our lack of imagination in it. And so that's why you see the modern day incarnations where people are trying to be more 
I, the corporate word is synergistic, but trying to create better networks of things based on that. Mm -hmm. And so that's the only thing that's different. I'm not saying that we're the only people who ever built things. I mean, many, 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 many groups have built tons of things and many groups have built lots of programs. I'm not saying that, but just after a disaster. And that was the opening that we needed for that to happen. And of course, now as the disasters have kept happening, people see that opening again and again and again, because disasters more than anything make this shit real for everybody. Yeah. So moving forward a little bit, it seems that you've been influenced somewhat by the post-left. Should anarchy move beyond leftism? If so, what would that mean for anarchist action and tactics? can mean anything you want. Yeah. Well, the critique of organizationalism, the preference for affinity groups, all of these things. In what ways has post-leftism shaped your thought? And what, what practical effect do you think that would have? Well, we needed post-left anarchy specifically to break the black and red hold, which was still like a, an anarchism that was tied to a communism, black and red. You know, I'm not even trying to talk about yellow and black and gold and all of that shit, but just coming out because I came out of I came out of leftist circles. I came out of communists. You know, I was in those groups. Yeah. I was in socialist groups. Right. So when I talk about this shit, I didn't write about this stuff just because I was like, oh, I'm thinking about it. I'm not that good of a thinker. I'm a doer. So I built co-ops. I built collectives. I have built all of this stuff. I've sold businesses. I've, you know, like I, I do have an entrepreneurial spirit. Mm -hmm. You grow up poor, that makes you want to fucking, it makes you not want to starve. Yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah. uh, the, but the other part of it is I value working with people because I think collective brains are better than other. Not that you give up all your power, but that you, but you do that. And so I think that we needed post left anarchy to break that down to break that stranglehold that had been on. Because when I came into anarchy in the late 90s, when I really came into it, just before Seattle and all of that stuff started to break, Seattle World Trade Organization in 1999, which was the coming out party of anarchy in the United States in the modern 21st century. But when I, when I came to that, it was still the black and red stranglehold. I didn't want that. Listen, I don't think a, more unions is going to fix anything. That's a controversial thing amongst the left. So that was a sacred cow I couldn't go after. But I'm like, I want to build local cooperatives, worker cooperatives, where people have their own power instead of trying to empower people at ExxonMobil to fucking get $4 an hour better for 50 people while 500 other people are starving. You know what I'm saying? Or whatever. I'm just using these as a shitty examples. But so you, we needed post-left anarchy. But it's not just about breaking things down. We need to break things down with compassion. Because if you don't offer anything else, you're just intellectually masturbating. Because I want to always figure out how does it relate to somebody that's real, like my mom, who's not an anarchist subculture? How does it relate to, mm -hmm. like when I, you know, I lived in different communities with like the brother and sister on the block, the crack, the crack addicts who were there. How does it relate to them? I'm very serious about this. And so if it doesn't relate, it's not fucking valid. So... It doesn't matter what you call call it. I don't even fucking have to use the word anarchy. The word I use a lot is blue potato. Blue potato yeah, so we yeah. can just call it blue potato. <laughs> if we all agree on that, who gives a shit? It doesn't matter because anarchy is not about selling an ideology. Because I'm not trying to proselytize. You shouldn't, none of us should be able to try to proselytize. We should just be doing it. But post-left anarchy gave us that first big break in the 21st century where we could really begin to think about that stuff. To challenge the leftist ideologies, really, and activism. For sure. So non-serving media has plans to explore the topic of firearms with you very soon at a greater length. So everyone should keep an eye out for that when we do finally get around to it. And you put together a book called Setting Sights that was dedicated to exploring the hidden histories of community armed self-defense. What's a healthy way to think about firearms and their role in our struggles? Well, first, we have to challenge the dominant narratives and paradigms that are already associated with guns because they're lethal weapons. But mostly, I'm going to talk about heteropatriarchy, using political terms, you know, white men kind of running things, and those with guns having power over the rest of the people. Well, the way I am approach the ideas of a liberatory armed self-defense is one, it's communal, it's not individual. Two, it's temporary. Instead of becoming a standing militia like you see on the far right, you only take up guns when it's necessary for your community. And guns have no more or no less power than other roles in your community. Child care, taking out the trash, feeding people. If you don't take care of those things and you only do guns, you're a shit fucker in my book. 
you know, because childcare and taking out the trash and feeding people are far more important and will get communities far along rather than armed struggle. And then the last piece is how do we not fetishize guns and the heroic myths of um, how do we demystify guns for the leftists and for, well, just for anybody who wants to think about it in terms that make sense to people that aren't about, I'm stockpiling toilet paper and guns because I'm afraid. Because I can tell you, I don't give a fuck about you if you got toilet paper and guns because I've got a garden going with these other people over here that's going to feed us for the next 20 years. You know, you can fucking when, when you've used up your ammo, killing people for more toilet paper in the next few weeks to wipe your ass. What the fuck have you got? You got nothing. I mean, that's the real. That's what I told people when COVID was first hitting. So in the book, it was an exploration of violence in my life and violence in other people's lives. And so I, I did an analysis section because this book, the only reason I did this book was because it needed to be done. There had not been one that really needed to address these things. And it just was a glaring hole in anarchist and liberatory thought. And so not that I'm so smart or anything, but I'm just like, hey, look, where are we? And so again, in rolling rocks uphill, like mutual aid and breaking from red and black, that we should maybe have guns it was one of those narratives that I had to roll the rock uphill for a long time before people could see any value in it. When we took up guns and anti-racist action and for anti-fascist actions for in the early 2000s and people who took them up in the 90s and the 80s, I mean, we did it to protect our lives for real. It wasn't it wasn't fetishism about it. And that outside of that, nobody else even wanted to look at it. And when I when and when even after Katrina, when we took up arms against the white militias and against the police. Activists came in and leftists came in and they shook their fingers. They wagged their fingers at us and told us that was wrong. We should not have been doing that. And we, you know, like, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of pushing things uphill to push ideas again, to challenge our imaginations. I mean, that's, that's the thing. So the gun book was about that, but also it has real stories from people who lost a lot from taking up guns. And I wanted those in there that people who had gone to prison for decades, people who had lost family members, you know, like, really important things to to know that to demystify it that there's a use for it but that it we cannot become standing armies because then we perpetuate the problems that we have and um and i also looked at the zapatistas a lot in that and the way that they rotate it if you have power with a gun and you're an asshole they you don't have a gun anymore you know you're on some other duty and so that's what happens they rotate power so to keep that and so so it, it kind of addresses some of those things and we could talk about it far more you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking forward to uh, to doing that. Hopefully, we can turn this into a video series where we we actually um, flesh out some of your ideas on that even further. But um, appreciate that response. Oh hell, there's people who've written so much better shit than me. After that, I just needed. It's just a, that book is just an opening. You know, it's just a it's a a place to talk about it because it needed to happen. And and I think that there's a lot more better things being written now that are going to build on those ideas. You know, people who are way smarter than I am. And I'm glad. Thank you. <laughs> Something that I've noticed about you also is that you're often self-deprecating. You don't give yourself enough credit for some of the things that uh, you say. I'd like to push back on that. I get plenty of credit. I'm, it's not even false modesty. It's totally fine. <laughs> I'm just okay with it. I don't think it's false yeah. modesty. You're just constantly self-deprecating, and your book is awesome. <laughs> Thank you. That's all I'm going to say. So, All right, so let's move on a little bit. I'll receive that. All right. So after spending so many years giving yourself to furthering anarchy and its aspirations, is there anything you regret? And conversely, what's been the most rewarding elements of it? Well, the most rewarding elements are being able to see the ideas of anarchy gain so much credibility across so many places. The ideas of mutual aid, even if they're not liberatory necessarily, have spread so much. Whereas before, that, that hadn't happened in anarchy all through the 20th century. And the ideas of direct action. But anyway, just the ideas of anarchy have spread and it, ch it changed, totally transformed leftist organizing and right organizing. I mean, not right wing, but, you know, like that left right paradigm, whatever that you know what I'm talking about. Libertarians of all stripes, that it's affected that and thinking about this. And we broke the stranglehold of communism and, and big S socialist on organizing political movements of the left. So that's a proud, that's, I'm pretty proud of that. We, we made people to begin to think for themselves and not listen to party politics. No, it doesn't matter who it is. The other thing is that I pushed some ideas along, like liberatory gun thoughts and, and mutual aid. I'm pretty proud of those things. Even if they get watered down, even if they get totally changed, even if they're misrepresented, because every idea, that's everybody has their interpretation of it. But I'm pretty, I'm kind of proud of those things. 
the things I changed is that I wish decades ago I had realized about this activism conundrum earlier on instead of listening to people because you know when I when I came back into activism I was already a grown man I was in you know I was in my 30s you know and I was already uh, I had just decided I wanted to come back and devote my life to doing stuff to make the world better instead of trying to make money. And so I sold my business and, you know, I had some money, but activists always kicked me as bougie and, you know, and all these things. I was like, and I used to let it bother me so much because I grew up poor. Sure, I had some nice things. I didn't live extravagantly, but I had some nice things. And so, but I let that bother me and get inside of my head and I always had conflict with it. And so I think I made not very good choices sometimes along the way because of that. So instead of, if I'd recognized the limits of activism and all my frustrations with it all the time I was engaged in it as a grown man, I think I might have engaged a little bit differently. But you know what? I mean, hindsight, I can't change anything. Like I wouldn't I wouldn't go back and there's no specific thing like, oh, I'd go back and do this or do that or whatever. It's just things are just the way they are. The arc of life is, lo- is long. It's kind of short, but <laughs> the arc of life just happens, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and so that's kind of where that, that, that kind of comes from. So if you wouldn't go back and tell yourself to do something differently Mm -hmm. before getting as involved as you were, what advice would you have to others who are just getting into this sort of stuff, who are interested in making a change? Well, I think listen to your own voice. We always frame spectrums as this or that, because that's the, the way it happens in the United States. Everything has to be a zero sum. Somebody's got to win. Somebody's got to lose. And everything is just a spectrum. You know, like violence to nonviolence is not really, it's just violence and less violence. I mean, it's a spectrum. So, so individualism versus uh, group think versus collective thinking, we always treat it like it's either or. You either have to be an individualist, liberation yourself, or you have to be a collectivist. And that is bullshit. You can have both. So what I want, if I could go back and tell myself things, I would say, I should have listened more to my own self, even within collectives, because I let group think overwhelm ideas that I knew were good, that I had already been in, that were not harmful ideas, that were not about seeking more power. And I think the other thing I would tell myself and I would tell everybody along the way is be far more kind to yourself. Please fucking be more kind to yourself. Listen. We treat everything, everything as as if it's life and death, and it's not. Some things are life and death, and you will know that. I promise you, you will know that, and you can do it. But we can't treat every social issue, every social outrage as life or death because it crushes our spirit and our hearts to do things. And I wish I'd listened to myself and been kinder to myself about that along the way. Yeah. So So how how do we prioritize what to tackle then? I mean, because there's so many things that seem so immediately necessary to take care of. This is what I would say is just approach everything with dual power. We've talked about this many times, not fucking old communist dual power, but the idea that you resist on one hand, which is what we do all the time, but you build on the other hand. So you're building together and that when we're doing this, that we need more building. You know, here's an analogy I'm going to give is a forest. A forest everywhere around the world looks the same from outer space. It's got the same elements to it when you're looking down at the, at the earth, not the flat earth, the round fucking earth. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, um, you know, but when you get to each one, a desert in the northwest coast of the United States is different than a, a I mean, a desert a forest in northwest United States is different than one, say, in eastern United States. OK, but they have the same elements to them. They have similar elements. So what if we begin to build liberatory foundations built on ideas, ethics and ideas, but we don't know what the plan is on how we're going to enact it, but we're going to challenge ourselves. And so it's more than just thinking of ourselves as more than just consumers or voters. And I would even say more than just activists. And we begin to take these untraveled roads in there. And to do that, you can't resist everything. Mm. To begin to challenge your imagination, you can't resist because all we are stuck in is the cycle of resistance, 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 because everything is so terrible and we can, we can never do it. We'll never get out under it. We're always going to push the rock uphill. And that is necessary. A rock needs to travel uphill, but sometimes it, it's got to get to the top and it got to start coming down. So at some point, we have to make a break and say, a forest didn't resist and come into being from resisting everything. It came into being from building. 
So it's the same with, with social and political movements. We must build more than campaigns. We must build more than groups that are just resisting. We must build things that are liberatory. And I don't mean like just more fucking consumer co-ops or fucking more credit cards or shit like that. I don't know what it looks like, but it has to be liberatory. It has to have a liberatory thought to it. So if I build a co-op, a worker co-op, which I think is probably towards the most horizontal organizing that you could have, is that it has to be liberatory. It can't just be in and of itself. It has to look bigger. When I was building, when we built Treasure City Thrift here in Austin, Texas, which still exists, we built it as part of this ecosystem of economics that were made to fund resistance that nobody else was going to fund. That's the whole thing. That's the magic of Treasure City Thrift. That was the magic of Ecology Action, the anarchist worker run recycling center that I, that I was part of for a long time, for six years. And so because we need that, because if anti-fascists, for example, are being arrested and targeted, we need to give them support. You can't just have a liberal co-op and go, well, we can't touch that because that'll affect our 501c3. So there's something in between that. So I think not just thinking individually and collectively, but also thinking about how do we build liberatory things that actually re that help along with resistance, but don't just keep us in resistance. Because... As disasters happen, we have seen the consolidation of fascism worldwide, but definitely in the United States, more than, than I've ever seen in my whole life. And I used to think it was super fascist in the 80s. Yeah. But I was like, nope, super fascist now. So so that's that's some of the approaches to it that I think about. And again, I'm not trying to sell an ideology. So if it happens, great. I'm, I want to be a part of that. But if it doesn't happen, it's okay. We just continue on as we go, as the world you know, continues to, to change and fall apart in the, the way that we know it. All right, Scott. So towards the end of these interviews, I like to do a lightning round where I list a series of people or ideas and have my guests respond to each item in one minute or less. Are you down? <laughs> sure. What the fuck? <laughs> All right. <laughs> First on the list is Herman Wallace. I miss him so much. He was one of the Angola Three, one of the longest held political prisoners in the United States. He was a good friend of mine for 20 years. We worked to get him and the other two members of the Angola Three out of prison for almost 20 years. They're free now, but Herman died two days after getting out of prison. But all of these men were in Angola prison for being Black Panther Party members in the 60s and 70s. And Herman Wallace, he wasn't a perfect person, but he was a good man. And he kept the drive for not just their freedom, but everybody's freedom behind prison when nobody was looking. There was no media. There was nothing to gain from it except people's own liberation because he wanted that because his heart was big. That's what I have to say about him. I miss him. Yeah. Yeah. Next item is gang stalking. It's total bullshit. I don't even want to address it. It's a fucking conspiracy. It's a conspiracy theory that doesn't exist. I'm sorry that people have schizophrenia and that they think I was gang stalked, but I was not. It's not even worth looking up. Yeah. All right. It was one of your most popular articles. You sort of became a poster child for that sort of shit. And it is. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And it is the most popular article on my fucking website yeah. again and again. I can't help people. I get I get hundreds of letters a year. I cannot help people with it. It's psychological problems. Right. And I don't mean that in a dismissive way. Sure. You know, I, I, I actually have. I'm sorry for all those people. I just can't help them. For sure. Electoral politics. Electoral politics is like recycling. If you're not going to do anything else and you know, fucking pull the lever every couple of years, you know, I mean, sure. Okay. If that makes you feel good, do it. Is it going to change systems? No. Will it alleviate suffering? Yes. Is it more or less than other forms of systemic change? Mm, that's debatable. You know, it depends on what you're going for. If you just want to, if you want more rights under the system of power that the slave owners already own, or if you want your, you want systems of power of ourselves. And so, it just depends. I'm not telling people not to vote. I'm not either or on hardly anything. And so it's a spectrum. You have to decide if it works for you. And what, what my anarchist friends in the Europe say is like, it's so American of you to say that. <laughs> but I'm like, dude, I don't give a shit about ivory towers. I don't give a fuck about how much you're fucking read about anything. It has to make sense to people. Ideas have to make sense, and, we, and they materially have to make sense for some people, and they, at least with ideas, they have to make sense. And so some people are not ready to leave that. 
you know, and it's fine if, if that makes them feel secure. And listen, I'm not going to lie. This whole thing with the, that shit fucker that was the president of this last round scared the fuck out of me. I almost thought about voting for the first time in 20 years. But if I didn't know better, that wasn't helpful for me to do it, I wouldn't have done it. You know, sure. I, I would. It, that's why I didn't do it. You know, I didn't I would have had to go register and do all the shit. But I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. So it's not ideological. It just doesn't make sense. There's I can't see any way that it makes sense for me. So. So related and last item on the lightning round, mm -hmm. democracy. Hmm, that's a loaded ass word. <laughs> I don't care. I, you know what? Democracy is not what I want. I want people to cooperate. Yeah. You know, how we develop the systems and how the scaling and stuff like that. I don't, I don't know. I'm not against democracy. It's just such a it's such a challenging word. I use it in shorthand sometimes, but it's not a word that I'm looking for when I'm trying to think about being free. Right. Uh, it just seems like a fucking 13th or 15th century or whatever it is. You, you would have to tell me how old that damn word is. It just seems like one of those kind of words. Um, whereas anarchy, I claimed it and worked on it for the last, you know, 30 years. But democracy, I never, I've not really ever embraced that as the goal. I want liberation. I want collective liberation, which is different than democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and not just ideologically or semantically or, you know, it's, it's definitely different. It's a different set of thinking about things. I think that democratic institutions can, you know, they, I mean, they can get people towards that to degrees. You know, I'm not going to I'm not kicking it, but it's just not my thing. OK, so we are going to do some listener questions. So we have 10 more minutes and then we can um, and then we can wrap this thing up. OK. Is this helpful? I mean, like, I mean, I hope people are getting stuff. A hundred percent. I mean, you and I could just bullshit any time. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. It's totally helpful. It's just if weird not, not to uh, see people. You know? <laughs> so. No, I know. Sorry, sorry if I'm not giving you so much feedback on some of the shit you're saying too. I'm just trying to like move along. Dude, we talk about this shit yeah. all the time. So. Yeah. <laughs> I had so many questions, and I just can't acknowledge everything you said, even though they're interesting, because I have so many questions. But all right, so the first listener question is. And feel free to pass on any of these if you don't want to answer. Okay, I will. Uh, the first <laughs> listener. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, what do you think of 3D printed guns and how they'll affect the global wave of protests we're seeing? I'm not the person to ask about that. Okay. I, 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 don't, I, don't, so, I don't write about guns in that way. I don't think about guns in that way. And I don't have enough informed opinion on it. Okay. No worries. Mm -hmm. um, Another listener question. Now more than ever seems like a good time to join or create mutual aid and horizontal organizations. Are there organizing methods you recommend like general assemblies a la Occupy or spoke councils? Sure. Yes, all of them. Yeah. T do them all. <laughs> all right. Because there's, well, they have different needs for different things. But horizontal organizing, this is the one, actually, this is going to be my spinoff of that, is that Horizontal organizing doesn't mean that everything is fucking flat. This is the problem that we have often in, in, in activist organizing is that we assume that horizontal just means that everything is flat, that if you have experience and more knowledge about something, that you have to just knock it down. And then if those who have less knowledge or experience than you have to be up, now that's the goal and the dream, right? But really what that thing is, is, it's an influx of stuff and that some people do know more than other people. Some people just have far more experience than other people. And for us to deny that just because we think that's more horizontal is a fallacy. So, yes, striving for power sharing is really what we want. And where the same stratas of society, civil society, don't continue to I'm not even talking about elites. I'm, I'm talking about amongst ourselves. We don't want the same people to rise to the top. You don't need fast talking white guys like myself always to rise to the top. But that doesn't necessarily mean tokenizing somebody who's quiet to make them do that. It's, a, it's about changing the way that you have conversations, the way that you organize in those things. And so horizontalism is about training and teaching and showing, but also recognizing that there can be uneven power structures at any given time. An example, two examples. At Katrina, when we took up arms, just before the formation of Common Ground, we still had people around, but it was a hierarchy because we needed it to be because it needed information needed to move fast amongst the people who were carrying guns around and possibly getting in conflict. But we didn't try to exercise more power amongst the medical clinic or the food people or anything like that. We just amongst ourselves. So that's one example. 
But the thing is, the person who had the most power in that, which was me, I didn't try to wield that over everybody and shut them out. I still listened to, we still listened to what everybody was doing so we could keep it as horizontal as we could. But at some point, the buck had to stop with somebody. So that's an extreme example. So that showed me, because that was the first real attempt at doing that, where I thought about that. So at Common Ground, we began to organize lots. We have general assemblies, because we'd have thousands of people on the ground at the same time. Then we'd have each collective could organize how they wanted, whether it was even was some hierarchy in it, or it was totally flat, or it was just a couple of people, or a big giant group of people. Because it's going to take, again, forest analogy, it takes all different kinds. There's elements that are all the same. But Again, don't make it a rigid ideology. Consensus decision-making is a great step towards that, but it doesn't create it. It's not a container that's going to make us all horizontal. It's not going to make us listen to each other more. I actually fucking hate it. It actually breaks down so much. And I have somebody who trained people to do it for decades and stuff, and I still use it, but I don't use it as this rigid container. We just, we just listen to people. If you listen and you can share, that's how you share power. If you approach the world with curiosity... So I think collectives, general assemblies, anything that you can get people in front of each other. But general assemblies, again, if you start to have everybody who comes in, any open idea that comes in now has the same power as you, man, good luck with that. Because just some random ass person walking off the street just now has the power of the 10 people who are organizing all the things that have been in there for years. Does that work? Nah, never works. Always causes conflict, you know, and I've been there. So don't be naive about it. Just be strategic in it. You know, like, how do you allow all the voices to be heard? How, what does it look like? And I'm a huge proponent of small collectives and small groups for everything. And then just networking those, not a big tent, never a big tent, because small collectives, you can have more aligned values with things or, you know, like that aren't imposed. It's your ethics. So like Joel yourself, if you have 10 values, and I have 10 things that I value, 10 principles, and we get along, then we can form a collective. But if we only have three things in common, I I mean, I still want to work together uh, towards common goals and stuff, but I want to be careful that I can have my autonomy within that and that you can have your autonomy within that also because we don't cross over on a lot of things. And that's okay because there's there's points of time when you work with people on specific projects and there's times when you are building the the community that you're going to be a part of. And activism is not a community. It's just a, it's just a catch all for all of us. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So last listener question is how can I get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia? You make it at your house. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't give it. If you're saying like, can I buy cappuccinos anywhere? I'm like, I don't give a shit if you can buy it. Just make the damn thing, you know. <laughs> so, all right, or get your friend right. to make I, it. I like it. Listen, while you're while you're doing trash duty, your friend can make the cappuccino for you. <laughs> there you go. All right. Okay. So um, let's see here. So going to the actual end of our conversation here, what's going on with the record label, real quickly? Emergency Hearts. Uh, why'd you start it, and what are your goals with it? So I came up through industrial music, which was very political in the 80s. I was in bands and toured with Nine Inch Nails and toured with Skinny Puppy and our bands did. You know, we opened for them. We opened for Ministry and all those bands. And I learned a lot through that. That's how I got politicized the most was through music. And so I always felt it was powerful in storytelling. And I'm a storyteller. And I think that we all do culturally. We get the seeds of information from that. And so a few years ago, somebody approached me about the music. And I started to realize that when I was doing speaking gigs, that younger generations cared about that music again, not just mine, but that music. And then some people started asking me about my music. And then somebody re-released it uh, two or three years ago. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And then I was like, wait a minute, why don't I do that again? Yeah. You know? And so, um, and so I just kind of jumped back in and started making songs again. And then I was like, well, I don't want to just make songs myself. I, I want, there's a bunch of stuff I want to release. There's things, and there's a political goal in this, I guess. And so, so the idea is to fund and take care of artists who are struggling right now during COVID, but also to present ideas. I have an anarchy series uh, that, that Joel is the producer of, uh, where he takes the music from Televangel, and then he takes the talking points from different anarchist thinkers that I like and, and value. And you make these beautiful audio paintings out of them. That's what you call them. And I love that. Uh, you 
you know, you're really good at it. Thanks. And that series resonates with people. And it's not, it's not preachy. They're just kind of talky and kind of, you know, set to good ambient music with beats. And so I just like the, the, the idea of being able to do that. So, and, and I find joy in it. That's the big thing is I'm, I'm doing it to find joy. There's money to be made in it, but I also find joy in it. And I get to collaborate with people again, like I was talking about. So it just punches a lot of those buttons and it's emergency hearts is just based on the concept of, you know, like, whatever is our passion and our compassion that drives us. And so, uh, yeah, so that's kind of what it, what it is, I think. And that's where, where I'm at. And, and I'm, I love working with you on it. And I like working with um, Lisa on it and, and a bunch of people. And I've just, you know, got to connect with really good people and doing it. So, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's been a joy for me too. We've got probably 30 seconds, I guess. Is there anything I forgot to ask you that you'd like to touch on before we end the interview? Or is there any uh, resources or any last words at all? Uh, the only thing I would say that's my pretty stock thing is that, listen, I talked about earlier how every minute, every moment brings you to this moment. Everything in your past, all of our histories, everything brings us to this moment. And every moment's a new moment. So you're standing on the edge of potential all the time. So if we begin to look for a bigger and broader horizons, the question I have is, how's it going to look? Hell yeah. All right, Scott. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And I know everyone else uh, appreciates you you coming on to your busy person with real world obligations. So we won't keep you any longer. But thank you. But uh, thank you. Stay sharp. I love talking to you. Yeah, it's nice talking with you. Thank you for having me on today. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed this installment of the show. If you liked this episode, be sure to check out our full catalog at nonserviummedia.com or at youtube.com slash nonserviummedia. And make sure to subscribe to receive notifications each time we release a new episode. If you're interested in seeing this project continue, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. And if you can't contribute financially, you can help us out simply by liking and sharing this episode. As usual, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project going. Finally, be sure to keep an eye out for the next episode. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.